So we've been talking about one of the simplest conductance-based neuron models, which is the Hodgkin-Hopson model. So this is the equivalent circuit that I've shown you before. We have a sodium conductance, a potassium conductance or current, and a leak current. And each of these, uh, each of these currents is modeled as a variable resistor with a fictive ba battery in parallel with a capacitor because the cellular membrane has insulating properties. It has a capacitive property. So this is the simplest conductance-based model, or, or not the simplest, but it's what, it was the first one that was really developed and uh, simpler compared to other uh, models that are typically used today. And if we wanted to make this model more complex, say we wanted to add another ionic current, we would just add another resistor and a battery in parallel. So, for example, there are calcium currents that can be very important in many neuron models or many uh, biological neurons. So if we wanted to add more complexity to this model, we just continue to add more resistors and batteries um, in parallel. Apologize for this diagram, my lack of drawing ability. But we can continue doing that as long as we like. So at the end of the day, uh, what is the equation that describes this system? So here I have the change in membrane potential. And we've already derived through Ohm's law that this is um, equal to the, um, it's related to the total amount of ionic current. So here I'm summing over all ionic currents. So that's what this sum is. And the amount of current going across each uh, branch or each avenue in this electrical diagram is given by the conductance, which is one over the resistance. So that's related to this part of the circuit. So all, all the resistors. And the second uh, component here is called the driving force, and that's related to the strength of these batteries, and how, or fictive batteries, and how far the equilibrium potential for that ion is from the actual membrane potential. And we've talked about all of that. Now the Hodgkin-Huxley model adds uh, an extra level of complexity that is somewhat more new to us, but we've considered it at this point, and that is that this conductance is not a fixed quantity, but actually changes over time. And it does that in the following way. So Hodgkin-Huxley modeled each conductance uh, as having a maximum conductance, which is a constant parameter, but two variables, M and H, M is the activation and H is the inactivation. And this gives the proportion of open gates. So if M is equal to one and H is equal to one, then both the activation and inactivation gates are open and the total conductance is equal to the maximum amount that is possible. And that's related sort of to the number of channels. So if all channels are open, the amount of conductance is proportional to the number of channels. Let's say all the activation gates are open, that would mean M equals 1, but if the inactivation gates are closed, that is H equals 0, then no current is flowing through that conductance. And we've gone over that. And we know that M and H are voltage and time dependent, so there's, there's ways to model that, and we've talked about that. The other level of complexity, which I'm glossing over to some extent, is that to improve the fit, uh, there's usually two exponents here. It's usually M to the P and H to the Q, and these are also um, can be different for different ionic currents. So we already understand how to add more ionic currents to the Hodgkin-Huxley model. The next level of complexity that I really want to focus on in this video is um, spatial complexity of neurons. So here are four examples of different neurons, and they've been traced or drawn. And you can see that these four types of neurons look very different, and therefore you might expect that their electrical properties are going to be very different. And furthermore, each one of these neurons has such uh, spatial complexity that you don't uh, we, we know that it's impossible to really model these as simple um, Hodgkin-Huxley type models. So in our previous example here, we can put as many currents as we like, but we only have one uh, V or one dV dt. And what this means is that we're really modeling a single um, sort of spherical uh, neuron, and this is called a single compartment model. And single compartment model also a uh, ice potential model, is only good for modeling a piece of this neuron. So we've really just been talking about a single part of the neuron which has a well-defined membrane potential. You might imagine that if you simultaneously recorded from this piece in blue and this piece of the neuron in red, that the membrane potential at V we'll call V1 and at the blue part we'll call V2, that the voltage out here might not necessarily equal the voltage down here because perhaps this area has a different set of ionic conductances, perhaps less sodium and more calcium, for instance. And because of this, there's no good way of developing a single 
um, model like this that really captures everything the neuron is doing. And furthermore, we, we think that these dynamics are really important. We, and we, have, uh, we don't have much understanding of dendritic computing, but we, we know that it is possibly very important for neuron function. So we want to figure out a way of modeling not just a single part of the neuron's membrane, but the whole complexity of the structure of neurons, at least in a way that captures some of the fundamental properties of a neuron's particular spatial features. And the way this is typically done is with what's called a multi-compartment model. So here on the left, we would have perhaps uh, the real morphology of a neuron. And it's really impossible or computationally limiting um, to model every single feature of the neuron. So what we try to do is we break it down into the components that we think are most important. And this is, uh, there's not necessarily a clean cut rule for this, but uh, depending on the level of detail you want in your model, you simplify the real morphology into um, some more, more simplified form. So here we have uh, three cylindrical components, a, a sort of uh, spherical uh, soma component, so the soma is a cell body, these three dendrites, or th these three cylinders correspond to the dendrites, and then we have a few other cylinders at the bottom here. So we have now multiple electrical compartments and we allow each of these to have its own membrane potential, so we could label them V1, V2, V3, etc. And each of these compartments is modeled just like a simple Hodgkin-Huxley model that we have talked about before. So here would be perhaps one compartment, and here is another compartment. And each of these compartments obeys this basic rule. Each of the compartments evolves according to this equation. So really everything we've been learning so far is building is the building blocks to a multi-compartment model. You just take a bunch of compartments and the only um, important and perhaps somewhat tricky thing is that there is a resistance that couples these two compartments. But we already know how to how these resistors can influence memory potential. So now in our more complicated multi-compartment model, we have to add just one additional term that takes into account these um, resistors that are connecting the compartments. So this is our final equation that describes the memory potential of any one of these single compartments. So this looks a little complicated, but it's really not all that different. So first of all, I'm, I'm looking at the change in the memory potential for V sub K, or the kth compartment. And this is, you're going to have a whole series of these differential equations uh, because you have many different compartments. You don't just have one anymore. And now for each compartment, we first compute the current going into that compartment due to its ionic currents. And this is exactly uh, what I showed you on the first slide. You're just summing over the conductance of each current and the driving force. So that's already done. Now, we just needed to add this additional component, which is the coupling conductance between different compartments. And here I'm summing over a new variable, j. So j is keeping track of all the partners that a compartment has. So if a compartment has, let's say, three three is connected to three other compartments, it's going to have three more junctional um, currents due to those connections. So here, g, k, j is the conductance given by the resistor between the two compartments. They're the kth compartment and the jth compartment. And then the driving force is just the difference in membrane potential between the two compartments. So this is you know, the same exact form. We're still using Ohm's law. And this gives us, um, we just extend it very simply to to model multiple compartments. And this is how we can take into account neurons with more complex morphologies. So this neuron here, we have sort of one compartment here, uh, or there's like two compartments down here. Each of them can have their own conductances, and then there's, it branches off into this uh, Y shape, and then uh, continues according to, so, so this is just a slight sketch of what the, what the neuron we're modeling in this case is. So you can build your neuron in sort of any arbitrary way, and you can use this simple technique to extend your single compartment methods to multi-compartment neurons. And while it's very simple to build these more complicated neurons, it's a lot more complicated to interpret them. So that's something that we're going to leave to future videos. But it's really not all that different than things we've seen already.